questions is, and this comes down to that like speed piece, is how do you know when we need a common denominator and when we don't have to worry about it? So I want to just take a quick step back before I dive into that um, and give kind of a dumb example, but it's okay. I don't recommend trying to take notes on this because it will be jumbled up and look weird later anyway. Um, so I am going to build us a chocolate bar. Um, I don't know, right? You can kind of use your imagination. Okay, so let's say that this chocolate bar has like the little creases so you can break it into eight pieces. And um, I've got a piece that looks like this. And I have one sibling. So let's say that my brother got a piece that looks like this. Yeah, I'll zoom out. Um, and, ooh, wrong direction. Okay. And my brother got a piece that looks like this. Doesn't have to be perfect. The thing is, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to share something with a sibling or a cousin or whatever. Really little kids kind of sometimes get hung up on fairness, meaning we wanna know who got the bigger piece. Or we wanna know, did my mom actually steal a piece? Is that actually an entire chocolate bar? Okay. Really, no one cares about this. This is not what anyone is going to do. But the whole idea of a common denominator is I have two things and I'm either trying to combine them together or compare them. And in order to do that, I kind of have to be able to look at them both with the same size pieces. So getting a common denominator is taking this and breaking them into pieces that are the same size. I don't know. I kind of faked this. So let's say that those pieces are the same size. Now I can look at those two and say, oh, well, now that I'm comparing pieces that have broken down into the same size, this one's definitely bigger. Also, these didn't come from the same chocolate bar. I'm just saying my mom took pieces, obviously, because these two, I could not make turn back into the original chocolate bar. But moral of the story is, if I'm gonna compare two fractions, or two numbers in general, or if I'm going to add them together, I need a common denominator because that denominator represents the size of the pieces. So if I look at this first thing, the two thirds and the five thirds, because I'm adding them together, yes, I need a common denominator. Now I would claim this already has a common denominator. They're both already, sorry, I'm gonna get this thing out of the way a little bit. They both already have, they're both already a size of like one third of a thing. If I look at my second one, I am also adding these fractions, which means yes, I need a common denominator. And I'm just gonna abbreviate common denominator as CD. Now, when it comes to multiplication, I don't need the two things to have the same size. It doesn't matter if they have a common denominator. You will actually make more work for yourself if you try to get a common denominator. If I'm multiplying fractions, what I'm really saying is I'm taking part of the thing you have. So like if I multiply something by half, that's saying I'm gonna take half of it. 
It doesn't matter how big the thing is. I'm just going to cut it in half and take half of it. I don't care what the size is. I mean, I would if it's like a sandwich. I want to know if it's a big enough sandwich to be my lunch if I cut it in half. But in terms of these fractions, if I've got multiplication, doesn't matter. I don't need a common denominator. Now, I've got division, like inside of a division problem. Division is secretly multiplication in disguise. So if I've got multiplication in disguise, I don't need a common denominator. Same deal here. I've got multiplication in disguise because I've got division sitting there. That is also a nope. Addition and subtraction are two parts of the same idea. This thing is going to need a common denominator. So let's go have some fun getting common denominators. LCD stands for the lowest common denominator. I don't actually care if you use the lowest common denominator. It generally means you'll be working with smaller numbers, but any common denominator will do. So when I look at the denominators of three and six, can anybody tell me what the lowest common denominator is? I hear some whispers of six, be brave. Yes, that's our lowest common denominator. Are there other denominators that would work? Cool. I could use 12. I could use 18. I could use 24. But all of those things are going to mean I'm working with bigger numbers. So if I don't want to work with bigger numbers, that's usually why textbooks are like, no, no, you should choose the lowest common denominator. It doesn't actually matter. So my lowest common denominator would be six. And if I'm going to rewrite the terms to both have a common denominator of six, it's that 2x over 3 that I've got to deal with. I talked about in the first day of class, we were doing additive law of exponents, and I was like, hey, mathematicians didn't actually make up a lot of rules. There are really a very small number of rules. One of those rules is that 1 is our multiplicative identity. And what that means is, if I multiply a number by 1, it doesn't change the value of the number. So when I'm looking at that 2x over 3, if I need it to have a common denominator of 6, then I'm going to multiply this by 2 over 2. Because secretly, 2 over 2 is equal to 1. So this piece of it is going to leave me with a 6 on the bottom and on the top. 2x times 2 is going to be a 4x for us. One of the overall objectives for this course is correct use of mathematical notation. I care that when you write an equal sign, the two things on either side of it actually are equal. And I will take points off and point out to you if you've incorrectly stuck an equal sign somewhere. And the reason I'm bringing it up right now is I've done like part of the problem, but I haven't actually done the whole thing. So I don't just want to keep going with equal signs. I kind of want to somehow reset this. And I didn't give us a lot of space. But now I can take that 4x over 6 and add that to 5 over 6. So I have 4x of the 1 sixths, and I have 5 of the 1 sixths. When I combine those together, I'm looking at 4x plus 5 all over 6. That is considered the simplified form. And also, there are a lot of times where I really need to be able to go backward from this and break it up to be that 2x over 3 plus 5, 6. So kind of going back and forth with that is going to be another thing that we practice throughout the quarter. Okay. I will let you handle B on 
your own, but let's get a common denominator first. What denominator do you all wanna use? Sure. I think 30 is also a good choice, but for part B, go ahead and rewrite each of those so that they've got a denominator of 15. Thing about how many should we learn Would anybody like a little more time to keep working on their own? Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and rewrite each of these. And I think I'm going to try to squeeze it in over here. So that one fifth, I'm going to rewrite to give it a denominator of 15. So I'm thinking, what do I have to multiply five by to turn it into a 15? And that's gonna be three. So that I don't change the problem, I need to be multiplying by a one because if I multiply by three over three, I haven't changed that number. Same kind of thing here with my X plus two over three. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in parentheses just because visually it's a little distracting for me. And I know that here, I need that denominator to be a five. And so that I don't change the problem and I'm just multiplying by one, I'm gonna multiply the numerator by five also. So if I change these two fractions, I'm looking at three fifteenths minus, now here's where life gets fun. I've got my 15 in the denominator and we have choices for how to deal with the top. Shall we distribute the five in now or deal with it later? Anyone have a vote? There's no wrong answer. No, I heard no. So I assume that means deal with it later. That's what I'm gonna decide that means. Notation wise, if I stick two things in parentheses next to each other, the implied math operator is multiplication. You don't have to have those parentheses there on the five. It just was an option that I made. Okay, now I'm gonna do this in two steps because I do wanna distribute the five out. Hmm. Yeah, I do wanna distribute the five out, but I'm gonna do it in two steps. The first thing I'm gonna do is say, hey, they've, I now have cut these into the same size piece. They both have that denominator of 15. So I'm just gonna stick the entire thing in the numerator with a 15 in the denominator. Now on top, I actually have two things that I need to distribute out. I've got to deal with this minus sign and I've got to deal with the five. Doesn't matter which one we do first or if we do them both together. I'm gonna to do them both together. And then you're gonna stop me if I make a mistake. So I'm gonna have three minus 
5x minus 10, whole thing over 15. Could I go one more step and simplify that? For sure I could. Um, that three minus 10, I could turn into a negative seven. So I could have like negative seven minus five X or negative five X minus seven. All those are reasonable options. This next part is really a notation thing. And this is not a criticism of anyone's handwriting. I haven't even like seen your handwriting yet. This is me just being real. I see a lot of mistakes happen because of handwriting. Because keeping track of what's in a numerator versus what's in a denominator, in my opinion, gets harder the smaller you write and gets even harder when there are lines on the page. So I am just pointing this out that that two thirds times X plus one, that means either that we're looking at, I'm just like focusing on the two thirds part. If I have two thirds times X plus one, I can distribute that two thirds in and make that two thirds of X plus two thirds. But I could also have chosen to write that as 2x over 3 plus 2 over 3. Getting your brain to recognize things that are equivalent is a big part of what we're working on this quarter in terms of the algebra part of it. Um, there are a lot of correct paths to a correct answer, and there are a lot of correct ways to write the same thing. Unfortunately, sometimes the answer in the back of the book is looking for a particular format, or in the case of the math placement exam, that you're all going to need to take eventually, right? Only one of your, only one version of a format of your answer might show up on that test. So recognizing and kind of playing around with equivalent forms is another goal of ours this quarter. Okay, that was all just to deal with the first part. I also have that four. These two already have a common denominator. That four does not have a denominator at all. So I'm gonna call my denominator three. And I just have to deal with the four. I'm gonna give that four a denominator of three by creatively multiplying by one. So in terms of combining all this stuff together, I'm gonna to have two X over three plus two over three plus four times three, that's 12 over three. And if I put all of that together into one fraction, I really didn't give us much space to write on here, did I? If I put all of that together, that's gonna equal two X plus 14 all over three. Kind of similar thing happening in D. Visually, things are kind of not on the same line together. So keeping track of the fact that that two and the negative X, the two and negative X, neither one of those has a denominator to it. So my common denominator here is just the only denominator we have, which is the three. Writing the other pieces with that common denominator, that two is gonna get multiplied by three over three. That negative X is gonna get multiplied by three over three. And the four thirds already has a denominator of three. I have also done something that if you're reading the textbook and kind of looking at some of the vocabulary, um, Multiplication of numbers is commutative. 
which means the order that you multiply the numbers in doesn't change the outcome. I don't like to say it doesn't matter because a lot of times if you're doing something in your head, the order that you choose to multiply in does matter because it makes the math easier, but it won't change the outcome or the final answer. So if I put all of that together, I know my denominator is gonna be a three here. I've got three times two, that's a six minus a three X and then plus that four, which if you wanted to combine that together, we could and call that 10 minus three X over three. And I guess we didn't really simplify this one, but I said it out loud, so I'll put it on here. Squeeze it in. Um, questions or complaints before I move on? Dun, dun, dun. Um, your packets are sort of stapled together, but it's not really a staple. So if you want to pull the pages apart, like if you're putting them into a binder or something, they should just pull right apart or stay together with their not stable staple. Um, last couple of problems on that previous one, we're definitely getting at the keeping this idea of sort of keeping terms correctly in the numerator or denominator, that's a big deal with fractions. Um, and it's definitely a place where people get themselves in trouble. So something that I wanna practice, I'm just gonna do all of these, but if you wanna tune me out and try doing them on your paper first, that's totally fine. So when I'm multiplying things together, this says that I have eight of this thing that's a size of three fifths. That denominator told me the size of the piece. So it's like I've got this thing that's a size of one fifth. I've got three of them that I've put into a cluster and now I've got eight of those. Nothing about that changed the size of the piece. It just told me how many total I have of that thing. So eight times three is 24. Now, if that feels uncomfortable to you and you would prefer to think about that eight as a fraction also so that you can multiply straight across the top and multiply straight across the bottom, totally fine. You could also choose to write this problem saying eight over one times three over five. And if that's helpful to you as a tool, go for it. But I don't need to see it. Like you're welcome to write it, but I don't need to see this piece. Same kind of thing here. I've got two thirds times four fifths. The rule is that I'm, when I'm multiplying fractions, I'm multiplying straight across the top and straight across the bottom. Would anyone like to have a visual on why it works that way? Okay, I saw a couple head nods, so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go ahead and write this out as eight fifteenths really quick and then switch gears to do my best at a visual. Okay. So wrong pens, don't use those pens on big paper. Okay. Talking to myself, don't worry about me. So I'm gonna make this thing it's just a box, but I was trying to multiply two thirds by four fifths. Visually, what that means is I'm thinking about if this whole thing is a one, 
Then I'm going to break that into three pieces and take two thirds of that. So that's a two thirds of the whole one. On the four fifth side, I'm taking this piece and breaking it up into five pieces because that's the size of the piece. And then I'm looking at four fifths. So my answer is this chunk in here. Now, I'm gonna break this all the way out. Broke that side into three pieces, break it this way into five pieces. So total, how many pieces are in there? If you counted all the rectangles. Right, I got 15 rectangles in there because it's three by five. And the multiplication that I wanted was this two thirds by four fifths, which means eight of those 15 rectangles is the multiplication part we want. Now the shortcut is obviously, if I've got two thirds times four fifths, the shortcut to get there is to say, oh, hey, I'm gonna have the size of my pieces are gonna be 15, 15th. And how many of them am I gonna have? Well, I'm gonna have eight of them. Okay. Back to my lovely handout, more fun with fractions. Like it'll come into focus in a second. Okay. This one here, same kind of thing as on the previous problem. No matter how big that two thirds is, that two thirds is a fraction. If you wanted to call that seven over one, you definitely could. But I'm just saying I've got 14 of those thirds. I started with two thirds and I had seven groups of that. Um, you, you have probably heard something along the lines of, I don't know, divide is the same as flip and multiply or division by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. That is true and helpful and we could draw pictures to show why that is, but I'm gonna jump into just doing it. So if I have two fifths divided by one seventh, that's equivalent to saying two fifths times flipping the one seventh over or taking the reciprocal to be seven over one. And now that I've got a multiplication thing going on, I get to multiply straight across the top and multiply straight across the bottom. When I have a fraction divided by a whole number or a whole number divided by a fraction, this whole idea of multiplying by the reciprocal instead still works. We just have to be careful about it. So I've got two fifths. And because that three isn't really a fraction, I am gonna think about it as three over one. So that I have a fraction to be able to take the reciprocal of. So multiplying by the reciprocal means multiplying by one third. And I am looking at two over 15. The other way that you can think about this is going back to that idea of the size of the piece. So if I'm looking at something that is, a, is two fifths, so the size of that piece is one fifth. And if I now divide that into three parts, the size of each piece is going to be one fifteenth, but I still only had two of them. Looking at this bottom one, in the numerator, I have a seven, so I can choose to write that as seven over one. And then multiplying by the reciprocal of the bottom, multiplying by two thirds, 
straight across, I've got a 14. Straight across the bottom, I've got a three. Questions, comments, answers, complaints before I go on to our next section here? Cool. Um, as a general rule, I don't personally care if you take things to lowest terms. But it's definitely going to be an instruction that you see a lot of times on homework and quizzes and things. I care that you have that you have a correct answer or an equivalent in, or an equivalent fraction of a correct answer. But this is a useful skill. And in particular, when we're shifting to pre-calculus and calculus mode, and you're dealing with word problems and you're dealing with all kinds of other problems and you don't have a calculator in front of you, it is helpful to be able to reduce your fractions in the intermediate steps so that it's easier to get to a correct final answer. So it's going to be something that we practice. If you're like crunched for time on a test or something, I never care if you finish this, right? This piece of it, it's the icing on the cake once you have the right answer. Okay. You do not have to do it this way, but one way that you can reduce fractions to lowest terms is to make sure that you have all of the pieces in their prime factored form. So if I look at 12 and I instead write that as it's prime factors, I think I can squeeze this in. So, 12 could be six times two, but then that six is really a three times two. So if I were to write that out, I could write that as three times two times two on the top times the seven that we had. And on the bottom, 14 is two times seven. Now I'm looking for anything in there that leaves me with a one. So two over two, that's a one. Seven over seven, that's a one. So my final answer here is six. Now, it's totally fine. And if you are good with arithmetic, it's totally fine to multiply seven times 12 and then do long division to divide that by 14. There's nothing wrong with that. And if that's the path that your brain would take, it's fine. For me, anytime I can make the numbers smaller instead of bigger, that's the choice I'm making because it's easier for me to work with smaller numbers. Okay, 144, that's one of the ones that last time I said you should have memorized. 144 is what times what? Cool, that's 12 times 12. So that's definitely one that you're gonna want to get memorized if you haven't yet. Here's one of the other reasons that personally, I like to actually write the ones out. Sometimes I see people cancel a couple of those 12s and then that leaves us with nothing at all in the numerator. When in fact, 12 over 12 is one, so my answer is one twelfth. In the interest of time, because I definitely want to make sure that we get to stuff on the next page, I'm I'm gonna a little bit push the fast forward button on these next ones. Okay, I, so that we've got complete stuff in our notes, but I'm going to do a little bit more of the work quickly for us. So 32, and I'll be honest, this is how I would actually do the problem. I don't usually do all the prime factorization up front, just being real. 
I got two squared. I'm probably lit. I'm just going to write that as four. So I've got four times four. And then I've got 32 on the bottom. Maybe I see that that's 16 times two. Maybe I see that that's four times eight. But whatever I see, I'm not going all the way to prime factorization. I actually saw this as four times eight first. So my four over four would cancel. And then I'd look at what I have left and that's still not reduced to lowest terms. But I'll break that eight up as four times two. And now I can reduce to lowest terms. Looking at this next one, the four is the only thing that I can break up. So I'm gonna break up that four as two times two. And then my final answer, I would write as three over 10. It would also be fine to leave that as three over two times five. Cautionary tale, depending on your handwriting, two times five can start to look like a 2.5 and suddenly you've gone from having a correct answer to a wrong answer. So just be a little bit careful about that. I've got five times six over 20. And if I looked at that, I'd be like, oh, I know that 20 is five times four. So let me do that one first. So my fives will cancel. And then I'm gonna look at that and go six is three times two and four is two times two. There's another one. My final answer is three over two. 180 over 12 times five. Well, I know that 180 is divisible by 10. So that's where I'm gonna go first. And I'm gonna write that 180 as 18 times 10 over 12 times five. And now if I do that, I know that the 10 is really five times two. So I've got 18 times five times two over, oh, hey, the 12, I can pull a two out of there also. So that would be like six times two times five. So I've got a one and another one and 18 over six. Well, let's see, 18 is nine times two and six, or hey, 18 divided by six, what is that? Yeah, so I could jump straight to the three, but I didn't see that at first. So I'm gonna actually write it like this. And nine divided by three, that's a three. There we go. I'm gonna leave these last two just looking at the time and I for sure want to make sure that we get to the last page because it's kind of the magic. So there is this magical thing. It's kind of the most magical of all of the math symbols and it's an equal sign. And when we have an equal sign in the problem, and we have fractions, it is a gift. Because an equal sign in a problem where I'm supposed to solve and fractions mean I can eliminate the fractions and I don't have to do this problem with fractions. Because if I've got an equal sign, then I can multiply both sides by a common denominator and get rid of all the fractions. Now I know if we're combining fractions, we talk a lot about a lowest common denominator. I especially don't care about a lowest common denominator if what I'm doing is eliminating fractions. I'm just gonna take the quickest denominator that comes to mind. That's why I didn't even write it as the lowest common denominator. Looking at this first one, give me one, give me a possible denominator we can use. Sure, let's take the eight. So if I multiply both sides of the equation by eight, I claim all of our fractions are gonna go away. So when I distribute the eight into this first piece, I'm gonna have eight divided by two, which is times that X plus one. And when I distribute the eight to the second piece, I'm gonna have eight divided by four, 
which is two times three. And over here on the right-hand side, I have eight X. No more fractions. Question for Melly. Um, so I'm not entirely sure why uh, on the first part you wouldn't you wouldn't multiply the eight on the top and then you get like eight x plus eight. We totally can, and also. Um, let me just write my problem down again. I had X plus one over two plus three fourths eight. Oops, okay, whatever. I wrote it backwards on one side, but you'll forgive me. Um, so let it come into focus. Cool. This is what we're dealing with. We have choices, which is really annoying in math, but we almost always have choices. Like, I'm not kidding. It's really annoying for students to have choices of how to correctly get through a problem. It's annoying for me sometimes. So if I take this 8x and I distribute it in, there are a lot of different ways that we can deal with each of those parts. So if I break this apart to say 8 times x plus 1 over 2 plus 8 times 3 fourths, I'm all, personally, I'm always going to make the choice that makes the number smaller, not larger. So if I look at this second part here, I definitely have the choice to multiply the eight times three and get 24 and then think, okay, so 24 divided by four, that's six. But I have the choice to instead think about that eight as saying, four times two times three fourths. And now my fours, because I've got one in the numerator and one in the denominator, those are gonna give me a one. And if I do the same thing with the eight over here, and I think about that as four times two times X plus one over two, I'm gonna make the choice to make those numbers smaller first. Now, it's not the only choice, but if it's not the choice you're going to make, don't multiply both sides by something. Because if you're not trying to get rid of the denominators, which you don't have to do, but if you're not trying to get rid of the denominators, multiplying both sides by something just makes the whole problem have bigger numbers. I'm gonna choose if I've got an equal sign that I wanna eliminate the fractions. And that means getting rid of the denominators. I've got time to at least get through one more here. I'm looking at five, four, and 10, and I'm thinking 20 for a common denominator. It's not the only choice, but it's the choice I'm gonna make. So one option would be to actually change all of the fractions in the original problem to have that denominator or because I've got an equal sign, I'm gonna multiply by it. 20 is the same as four times five, and it's also the same as 10 times two. And sometimes it's helpful to think about different ways that you could multiply it out on each side. So on the left-hand side, I might choose to think about this as saying five times four. And on the other side, I might choose to think about this as saying 10 times two. Both times I multiplied by 20, but now when I distribute in, it's a little easier to see my denominators kind of immediately cleaning up for us. So when I distribute to the first part, that five over five is gonna leave me with a one. So I'll have four times two X plus one. And then the five times four distributed into the three fourths, the fours are gonna clean up and I'm gonna be left with five times three. On the right-hand side, super easy to make a mistake with that three, especially when you're writing this out, that X plus three can start to look like it's all in the numerator over the 10. So just be careful about that. 
but our 10 times two distributed in here, my tens are gonna simplify, leaving me with X times two. And when I distribute to the three, nothing simplifies. There is no denominator to need to get rid of there. So I'll just have three times 10 times two or 60. You do not need to finish the rest of these, um, but I am, I'm gonna call it there for today. I don't think we have time to get through more of them. Um, I will post all of this worksheet like finished off um, into Canvas in case you wanna look through that. I already posted the, I posted Friday's recording. Remember, missed about the first five minute of it, minutes of it because my internet cut out, but the rest of it is already posted into Canvas uh, or on YouTube. Have a lovely rest of your day. I am walking over to office hours in CADS right now if anybody wants to follow me over there.